those compliments am i audible yes a little bit uh, i think you should keep the mic little bit in front of your mouth yeah yeah is that yeah, okay yeah. you are perfectly audible yeah thank you uh, i have uh, prepared a powerpoint presentation and uh, before going on to the powerpoint i would like to clarify a few points i have named my uh, presentation edipus in india uh, a reception uh, a survey of the reception of uh, a freudian concept among indologists so at the very outset i would like to clarify what this presentation is not first of all it's not going to be as exhaustive as one may think from the name because uh, freudian ideas are manifold are diverse and uh, they have been revised modified rejected accepted by lots of indian thinkers and uh, these thinkers are historians psychoanalysts uh, art historians critical thinkers um, authors poets and uh, also psychologists doctors themselves so it's not going to be that exhaustive it's mostly going to be myth oriented because i shall talk about the uh, indian counterparts of the oedipus complex as uh, discussed by indian psychoanalysts and i am also going to uh, take uh, my audience a little bit away from hardcore british literature or i would not refer to british literature at all actually this is uh, a platform mostly for english literature people but uh, today i shall be uh, engaging not with uh, british stuff or american stuff but with and not even with uh, modern indian literature but with ancient indian classics mostly uh, whenever we are talking about the hindu myths we shall be uh, resorting to those indian classics so as i have already said uh, we cannot do justice to the entire oeuvre of the uh, freudians and those who are against freud's ideas uh, among the indologists we shall focus both on western indologists and indian thinkers who have approached um, uh, freud and approached indian uh, uh, classics from a freud freudian point of view finally i would like to say that i cannot be chronological because chronology is going to be problematic in this case so uh, i'm uh, just ready to share the screen may i yes of course just give me a moment in the first part the oedipus complex a brief survey of the concept in freud's writings i am going to elaborate the main points of the idea again i would like to remind the audience that i won't be chronological then in the second part i am going to talk about uh, freud's indian connections whether he knew about uh, indian philosophy uh, and other elements of indian mysticism and also about indian literature and whether uh, he uh, was influenced by them or not whether it was a two way process and finally in the third part i am going to talk about the main idea behind the presentation the reception of the uh, freudian concept 
so i think i don't need to repeat the story of oedipus neither do i need to introduce sigmund freud because Dr. all the Koham, people sorry are, to interrupt you can you just yes, hold sir. your microphone a little more closer to your uh, mouth yeah i am doing that yeah now it's okay thank you absolutely fine or oh, probably uh, uh, my finger was on the microphone <laughs> thank okay. you uh, welcome uh, so here we have the picture of oedipus and also of sigmund freud and neither oedipus nor sigmund freud needs any introduction because i know that the people who are on the other side of the microphone are doyans of english literature sigmund freud's idea of oedipus complex evolved over the years he had a fairly long life of 80 years almost 80 years more than that and his uh, uh, idea where well, ideas evolved according to the diagnosis um, of his patients uh, the insights he drew from treating his patients and this is a six part uh, structure of the evolution that uh, uh, the oedipus complex uh, uh, took and uh, this division has been done by bennett simon and richard blass in the early part the first phase that is 1897 to 1909 we find uh, sigmund freud for the first time mentioning the oedipus complex in his letters to wilhelm pliss and also in his uh, classic work the interpretation of dreams this is also the time when um, he wrote uh, his case history of dora so this is the first written uh, passage in uh, freud's writings on the oedipus complex here he writes i have found in my own case too the phenomenon of being in love with my mother and jealous of my father and i now consider it as a universal event in my uh, in early childhood so freud was not only treating his patients but also introspecting so there is as much to do with the idea of oedipus complex uh, with his own life as with the inner life of his patients and also we should take note of the fact that he is saying that it's a universal event and he is saying everyone in the audience was once a budding oedipus so when he is universalizing the concept of oedipus complex he is uh, implicitly uh, arguing that it's present in both the european and the non european child and in the male and the female child what is the oedipus complex this is a very complicated idea as i said it evolved over the years and i think because uh, i am restricted by time uh, i can always resort to pamela thauswell's uh, short and brief uh, uh, summary of what oedipus complex is this is from his 2000 book uh, sigmund freud uh, not his her 2000 book sigmund freud during the oedipal stage the baby focuses all his attention on his mother and wants to have her all to himself soon however he realizes that there is someone else the father in competition for his mother's love he begins to develop rivalrous and antagonistic feelings towards his father when he sees that his mother's attention is also directed towards this other person the baby wishes the father out of the way in his young mind he becomes a baby murderer he imagines killing the father so he can take his place sadly the violent young lover at this point must learn that he can't always get what he wants the father who is much more powerful than the baby threatens to punish the child by castrating him if the child doesn't stop coveting his mother the best the baby boy can hope for is to grow up to be like his father and eventually find someone like his mother the child thus identifies with the father or takes him for a role model in the freudian schema 
when the baby settles for identifying with his father rather than wanting to kill him he also internalizes the threatening punishing aspect of the father so here there is a clear constellation a triangle the baby boy the mother and the father the mother is the object of the baby's desire the father is the rival and gradually this rivalry is changed into is transformed into an identity and it is achieved via the castration complex as it is said here that uh, the child is afraid that the father would castrate him and he eventually gives up the castration complex and it's repressed the uh, the oedipus complex is repressed and latent even in uh, an elderly man so what are the implicit assumptions and presuppositions in such a theorization first of all it is uh, focused on the male baby though i have also said that uh, implicitly it may apply to the female baby also and we shall come to that point in a later uh, part of the presentation a tacit and implied bias towards heterosexuality so freud presupposes a heterosexual model but then later on he also uh, theorizes that there can be a possibility the boy that the boy identifies with the mother and uh, considers the father as the love object so that can lead to homosexuality but we shall come to that later again the child's psychological stages are divided into pre edipal and edipal but then the age bar is not clear and then there is the classic division of the stages of the psychosexual development of the child into oral anal and phallic stages i assume that everybody knows these uh, stages and uh, i'll not get into the detail much later in 1913 in totem and tabu freud reintroduces his concept of the oedipus complex and then he wrote another book moses and monotheism even later that is in 1939 though these books are uh, apart from each other by more than two decades there is uh, some there is a great connection between them often moses and monotheism is thought to be applied totem and tabu what, what was more vague and more universal in freud's arguments in totem and tabu was applied more specifically to the jewish community in moses and monotheism so what these two books do is they take the oedipus complex out of the individual the realm of individual psychology and they now describe the oedipus complex as the basis of group psychology the oedipus complex is also described as the origin of morality and especially the incest taboo in these two books and the oedipus complex is also considered as the origin of religion and especially the origin of the concept of god the father i would like to uh, uh, just take note of a few of the main points of Uh, the book totem and tabu so here freud argues that the totem animal which is considered sacred but which is also killed on a certain occasion and uh, the flesh of the totem animal is eaten by the community is actually a surrogate for the father the totem animal is symbolic of the father he comes to the conclusion that in bygone days in in uh, primitive days the community uh, was resentful of the father's domination so young men they killed the father the head of the tribe and then they were filled with guilt and they started the incest taboo that nobody would uh, 
marry or have any sexual relationship with the father's wives and uh, that was also the beginning of exogamy and he is also uh, of the opinion that the totem animal was then uh, accommodated or it, it was introduced as a symbol of the father the totem animal is worshipped as the progenitor of the clan and worshipped and then it is also killed as a uh, as a, as a reenactment of the ancient act of killing the dominant and violent, uh, violent father. And at a later stage of religious development, the totem animal is replaced with a deity, a father figure, and that's how institutionalized God-centered religions begin. And the deity himself demands the sacrifice in these institutionalized religions and therefore uh, the community is absolved of the guilt of uh, killing the animal. I am not talking about uh, the psychology of the Jewish community as he uh, talks uh, in Moses and Monotheism, but in Totem and Taboo, he follows the same, uh, same pattern and gives the same structural uh, uh, archetype to Christianity as well. Here he talks about uh, the relation between father and son in Christian religion. There can be no doubt that in the Christian myth, the original sin was one against, the, against God the Father. If, however, Christ redeemed mankind from the burden of original sin by the sacrifice of his own life, we are driven to conclude that the sin was a murder. And if this sacrifice of a life brought about the atonement with God the Father, the crime to be expiated can only have been the murder of the father. In the Christian doctrine, therefore, men were acknowledging in the most undisguised manner the guilty primeval deed, since they found the fullest atonement for it in the sacrifice of this one son. In the 1950 book, The Ego and the Id, Freud questions his own earlier assumptions and he argues that there can also be a reverse Oedipal complex. Here in this case, the boy it develops a rivalry towards the mother and it, he behaves like a girl. So some of the criticism that was uh, advanced by feminists against Freud was already thought out in Freud's own writings. Two of his most influential essays, The Dissolution of the Oedipus Complex and Female Sexuality, these were written in 1924 and 1931. They talk of the psychosexual development of the girl child as opposed to the psychosexual development of the male child. And it is here that he introduces the concept of penis envy. So his argument is that both the male and the female child starts fantasizing uh, the mother as the object of love because the mother is the person with whom the baby has its first contact and the father inevitably becomes the rival. But as the, the male child dreads castration, the female child discovers that she is already castrated. So she envies the male child and she is gradually frustrated and she thinks that she is a misbegotten uh, male and gradually the desire for the penis is replaced by a desire for a baby. I don't think for my present presentation this distinction is very important because I'm not going to focus much on uh, the psychosexual development of the girl child in the third part of my presentation. But uh, nevertheless, this was important for a bird's eye view of the idea of Oedipus complex. Now we come to the second portion of the presentation. In this presentation, I would like to say that Freud was not really unfamiliar with uh, Indian mysticism and Indian philosophy. 
though his association with uh, Indian philosophy was not as strong as the association that uh, Carl Jung had with Indian philosophy, but he did uh, read the Bhagavad Gita. He knew of the Brihadaranya Upanishad. He was familiar with the term Nirvana, and uh, he was also in constant touch with the Nobel laureate Roma Rola, who uh, in his late la later life uh, wrote books on, wrote biographies of Vivekananda and Ramakrishna and presented them to Freud. And Freud did read those books and uh, there is some influence of those uh, ideas um, about Indian mysticism in his late book, New Introductory Lectures on Psychoanalysis. A very uh, important but controversial uh, uh, chapter in the history of Freud's Indian connection is his uh, meeting with Rabindranath Tagore. The two met in Vienna on 25th of October 1926 and in a letter to Anna von West, Freud says that he was impressed by Tagore's appearance and compares Tagore uh, to Michelangelo's uh, depiction of God in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, I have already put a picture of uh, the depiction uh, in the presentation. And there is also some evidence that uh, the philosopher Surendranath Dasgupta was present at the meeting. But Tagore never said a word about uh, that meeting. He was probably not impressed. And uh, in his early works, uh, we do not find any influence of psychoanalysis on uh, Tagore's works and Tagore was uh, not really welcoming uh, towards uh, some critics who were using psychoanalytic insights in analyzing his poetry, though later in his life he was uh, much more open uh, to Freud's ideas. The first psychoanalyst in India was Girindra Shekhar Bose and he had his degree from Calcutta Medical College. We all know about him because uh, Ashish Nondi has written an exhaustive essay, The Savage Freud, on him. And uh, he also collaborated with Freud for two decades. He wrote his thesis, The Concept of Repression, and sent it to Freud. And he also sent uh, Freud uh, his uh, uh, he, he's uh, full of insights that he drew from treating his patients and Freud also wrote back to him regularly. So there was a brisk exchange of ideas between these two people. At the same time, we also have Owen Berkeley Hill who collaborated with Girindra Shekhar Bose. He was the first to talk about Hindu culture and personality from a psychoanalytic perspective. The Indian Psychoanalytic Society was already formed in 1922 by Girindra Shekhar. So this was uh, a historical trajectory that I wanted to uh, follow before delving into the conceptual elements in the presentation. Now again, I would like to remind my audience that we cannot adhere strictly to chronology because ideas have evolved over time. They have evolved differently. And also until the turn of the century, there were many ideas circulating in different quarters of the globe and people were not uh, really conversant of what was going on in other quarters of the world. So what Freud had thought or what Jung had thought independently was thought independently, equally independently by an Indian critic, an Indian psychoanalyst here in Kolkata. This was very much possible. So when uh, A.K. Ramanujan is writing the Indian Oedipus, then Devereaux, there was uh, a critic named, uh, a, a historian named Devereaux who had already written uh, uh, an essay on uh, Oedipal elements in the Indian epics, but A.K. Ramanujan do, does not seem to uh, know about this uh, very important essay by Devereaux. So 
I get into the conceptual elements, there is a kind of uh, tacit belief that Indians have no Oedipus complex. The first generation of uh, psychoanalysts did believe that way. And here I have two passages, one from Philip Spratt's Hindu Culture and Personality and another from A.K. Ramanujan's essay, The Indian Oedipus. In both these passages, the authors claim that Indians probably do not have an Oedipus complex, but then they also say that the Oedipus complex does have a place in the Hindu psyche. And it's very uh, dangerous and superficial to say that it doesn't. So I think uh, the audience and uh, the audience should uh, focus on the last part of A.K. Ramanujan's uh, is, uh, essay, the passage. He says that others have searched before me and concluded that Indian narrative has no Oedipal tales. And therefore, of course, Indians have no Oedipus complex. According to one writer, at least, he doesn't name who this writer is. The unfortunate lack of an Oedipus complex had prevented Indians from developing a form like the novel or from overthrowing the Mughals or the British by a bloody upheaval. But then Spratt mentions a character from the Mahabharata who slew his father, that is Babru Vahana. He defeated and slew his father Arjuna. And he says that Indians did have a, uh, an Oedipus complex in the early stage. He says that in those times, India does not appear to have differed from Europe. In later ages, these themes were repressed and their meaning was forgotten. So here he is applying the uh, characteristic of latency to the entire Indian community. Robert Goldman, the reputed authority on the Indian epics, identifies in an essay three types of Oedipus myths. In the first type, the son kills the father. This is the positive Oedipus complex of uh, Freudian origin. In the second category, the son attacks and kills a surrogate father. Goldman points out that in the Indian uh, family structure and in the Indian cultural milieu, a guru or an elder brother, an uncle can also be a surrogate father. And um, in this uh, context, he points out uh, the uh, stories of the Mahabharata, for example, Arjuna killing Bhishma and Bhishma attacking Parashurama, his guru, Krishna killing Kansa, his maternal uncle. None of these uh, characters is attacking a biological father. And the third type, in this type, the son submits to the father or the surrogate father. I would like to point out that the first type, which is the positive Oedipus complex, the first type does not go, uh, I'm sorry, not the first type, the second type. The second type doesn't go well with the uh, Oedipal structure in the Greek myth. I am sharing a picture of Bhishma uh, lying on his bed of arrows and Arjuna is there in front of him prostrating. There are his other uh, associates also. So in this myth, Arjuna who is playing the Oedipal son is actually an obedient son. The same applies to Babru Vahana in the other myth which is referred to by Spratt. There Babru Vahana frights Arjuna because Arjuna wants him to fight. And both Arjuna and Babru Vahana are reluctant attackers. In this case, Bhishma is not dead. And in the case of Babru Vahana, Arjuna is revived to life by Ulupi. And at the end, there is a father-son reconciliation. There is no death in Indian philosophy as such uh, in uh, mundane terms. So we can always question 
whether the Oedipal myth as it appears in the Greek tragedy is applicable in an Indian scenario. The third type where the son submits before the father and is metaphorically castrated is actually the one that is favored by the Indian uh, uh, tradition. And I have shared two pictures. The first picture is of Mukesh Khanna. I think everybody can recognize this picture. This is the scene of Bhishma Pita Maha's Pratigya from B.R. Chopra's Mahabharata. And uh, Bhishma is glorified because he accepts that subordinate position and accepts celibacy uh, as a uh, hallmark of his dedication to his, towards his father. And uh, in the picture that is uh, below, we see Rama prostrating before his father Dasharatha. So this is the favored uh, Oedipus uh, figure, or I should say anti-Oedipus figure in the Indian tradition. Now, should we call this the Indian Oedipus complex then? We cannot call it the Oedipus complex because if we need to challenge and Indianize Freud's ideas, we need an Indian name for it. So we have two names which are uh, quite uh, uh, evident and uh, which, which are used quite frequently in um, some quarters of uh, Indian psychoanalysis. One is the Yayati complex. This term was coined by Anand Paranjapi in 1998. Before that, the Ganesha complex was uh, a term that was coined by Sudhir Kakar. And we all know the myths uh, centered around these two figures. Yayati's son Puru uh, accepted uh, celibacy and old age uh, in order to please his father. And Ganesha, uh, he fought his father and was beheaded by his father. But at the end of the day, he was revived and rewarded and blessed by his father. So uh, in the Indian context, even if there is a father-son rivalry, uh, it cannot be the exact equivalent of the Greek myth. Now, this is a very interesting passage from Gananath Obesikare's uh, essay, Father Steps in Relativization. Until now, we have been talking about Oedipus and anti-Oedipus. I have referred to the Greek version of the Oedipus myth as the Oedipus, uh, as a positive Oedipus, and the Indian version of Yayati and Ganesha myth as the uh, anti Oedipus, the negative Oedipus complex. But how far are these binaries acceptable? So, Obisikere, uh, he uh, uh, writes about a hypothetical situation when Freud is practicing not in Vienna, but in Delhi. And here he has Hindu patients, and he doesn't know the Greek myth. Instead, he knows the Ganesha myth. And he writes, the Greek myth, owing to its absence, would be irrelevant for Freud. Hindu patients, he would note, have wish fulfillment dreams of submitting to the father and marrying a mother figure. What interpretative choice would Freud have had? Is it likely that he would have independently formulated and foisted on the Indians the Greek model? in the face of a different body of data? I think not. He would have little choice but to formulate the positive form of the Indian Oedipus complex in terms of identification with the mother and submission to the father. So this brings us to something which, to which we haven't paid our attention so far, the mother-son element. We have constantly been talking of father-son rivalry in the Indian context, but what about the mothers and diet? So uh, this is a very complicated relationship when we compare it to its European equivalent. And Sudhir Kakar in The Inner World explores uh, this relation for a whole, ch through a whole chapter. But I have here, uh, uh, quoted a small passage where he talks how different uh, the experience can be in an Indian context. And I have also cited a passage from Ramanujan's essay, The Indian Oedipus, 
which talks about the lingering uh, relationship uh, between the mother and the son even after the son had reached puberty so sudhir kakar writes an indian mother is inclined towards a total indulgence of her infant's wishes and demands whether these be related to feeding cleaning sleeping or being kept company moreover she tends to extend the kind of mothering well beyond the time when the infant is ready for independent functioning in many areas and although breastfeeding is supplemented with other kinds of food after the first year the mother continues to give her breast to her child for as long as possible often up to two two or three years even then weaning is not a once and for all affair for an older child may also occasionally suckle at his mother's breast and here ramanujan narrates a story where a father who had left his home for long comes back after many years and finds a strange young man sleeping with his wife Uh, sleeping beside his wife but then he realizes that it is his own son who has grown up and was innocently sleeping uh, sleeping beside the mother uh, so this brings us to a situation that is very different from the european mother son relationship and this also takes us back to girindra shekhar bosh and girindra shekhar's influential essay the genesis and adjustment of the oedipus wish this uh, can be thought as uh, a bible of uh, indian psychoanalysis here he talks of um, a very interesting thing he says that the son not only uh, is sexually or physically attracted to the mother because of the physical intimacy between the two but he also imitates her actions there is an identity of action and because of this he feels a wifely feeling for the father a wifely feeling so he wants to play his father's wife and wants to give him a baby and this wifely feeling leads to a castration wish so the son wants to be castrated so that he can play the role of his father's wife pretty well and this castration wish is a stage that leads eventually to the castration dread so girindra shekhar bos pays uh, a lot of attention to the uh, period before the castration dread it's not a leap from uh, the oral phase uh, to the castration dread so girindra shekhar bos's conclusion is very pertinent he says that if this is the schema of things then there is no hatred between the father and the son and there is perfect sympathy with all the three persons in the child father mother grouping in a later part of the essay he takes this argument much farther and says that that wifely feeling that development of uh, some kind of femininity in the son is not the end of it it leads to the castration dread as we said but then the son's feeling towards the father the wifely feeling also leads to a husbandly feeling because grindra shekhar is very particular about one thing that every wish every desire every uh, motivation leads to an opposite motivation of its kind so when the son develops a wifely feeling towards the father the son also fantasizes about being the husband himself and the father being the mother and he fantasizes that the father is feminized and he wants a retaliation by castrating the father so this is the point where the oedipus complex enters this is what he calls the oedipus point and this stage father leads to the ego identity with the father where a craving a sexual craving for the mother emerges and the feminine mother's image is finally replaced by that of the mother so this is a very complicated process uh, as we find in bos and it's not as simple as it sounded when we were engaging with freud when in freud also it's not that simple but freud didn't pay so much attention to the in between years and 
uh, then uh, both leads us to the concept of the oedipal mother so when the mother is replaced by the feminine father then the oedipal mother develops in the unconscious of the child and the oedipal mother is actually a combination of the loving mother and the destructive father and that's why we have aggressive mothers uh, in indian mythology mothers who kill the child the destructive uh, goddess durga or kali we also have uh, myths where the child tries to overpower the mother the oedipal mother and we have the myth of putana being killed by the baby krishna a more satisfactory interpretation of the oedipal mother is uh, perhaps given later on by jung and then by thomas newman who follow a different trajectory uh, but i am not uh, going to talk about uh, the union aspect of the mothers and relationship in this presentation because i am constrained by time i don't want to leave this uh, uh, part of the presentation without referring to this new book freud's india uh, by alf hiltebeitel hiltebeitel has done a very nice and exhaustive research on girindra shekhar he has documented all the letters that were exchanged between freud and girindra shekhar and also between freud and roma rola and he has analyzed uh, the the ideas of girindra shekhar and then he wrote a second part of this book which is called freud's mahabharata there he applies girindra shekhar's ideas to analyze myths from the mahabharata but i am not going to talk about that right now why i mentioned this is that hilte bible says that though girindra shekhar had reached to the conclusion that the indian child has an oedipal mother in its mind freud himself also had the idea of a phallic goddess or a phallic mother as early as 1909 and he does refer to mother goddesses in totem and taboo but as hilte bible points out that freud's arguments were based on the flawed concept of a matriarchal world that predated the patriarchal one uh, and there is uh, probably uh, no consensus and it is probably a dis discredited theory that there ever was a matriarchal world matriarchal society uh, there could have been and there are matrilineal societies but probably there never was a matriarchal society finally i would like to talk about makarant paranjape's uh, very curious and interesting uh, interpretation of nathuram godse's uh, act of killing gandhi he says that uh, uh, godse's act of killing gandhi is actually a dutiful son's revenge against an unfaithful father in order to avenge his wronged mother and in this constellation gandhi becomes the father figure the father of the nation the wronged mother is none but mother india the hindu rashtra and uh, godse is the edipal son uh, this is uh, a very interesting point which i wanted to analyze uh, i'm sorry not to analyze but to refer to uh, so with this i think i should conclude my presentation thank you thank you soham as expected you have uh, mesmerized the audience and uh, i hope i am audible yes sir you are but i am not being able to uh, go back to the yes now i can now i can see you thank you sir you have mesmerized the audience and uh, we all feel that uh, the lecture could have extended a little bit more uh, can you just uh, give us a little more information about this uh, ambitious book by makran paranjpe little more insight 
Well, uh, I think I cannot do that immediately, but then it's called the death and afterlife of Gandhi. And here he talks about the psychology of the modern Indian nation. He says that there is a guilt consciousness among us, just as the Jewish community had a guilt uh, after killing their father figure Moses. And we are continuing with that guilt. And that's why we go back to Gandhi every time, just as the Jews were uh, constantly atoning for the sin they have committed by killing uh, Moses. So uh, for the time being, I can say this, but then it's a very uh, common book. Anybody can just find it. I think, uh, uh, Dr. Soham, you need to switch on your video mode. We want to see you. Okay. Am I visible now? Yeah, you are visible. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you are visible. So, uh, as you can see in the chat box itself, uh, there are plethora of compliments and uh, I know many people uh, did not expect the lecture to be so interesting and so powerful, but uh, some of the people whom I know, I assured them that I know Dr. Soham for uh, since the days of his scholarship. And I'm sure whosoever attends Dr. Soham's lecture would really be uh, getting new insights as well as will be fascinating by the kind of will be fascinated by the kind of range of reading that he possesses and uh, you have uh, you know come up to the expectation dr Soham, and we are all very proud to be associated with a young scholar like you who is doing great kind of research and study your extensive study and research is something which uh, uh, a lot of the academicians today who have joined uh, can be a learning, uh, you know, exercise for all of us. And we are really very proud and happy that young scholars like you are doing justice to this academy. Thank you so much for such an insightful and such an interesting uh, presentation. And uh, as I said, uh, we expected a little more, but it's okay. Uh, you are there with us. You are an integral part of Gnosis now. So we will have you in the near future too. Uh, kindly give us the honor of uh, sparing some time and presentations of yours in the near future with us as well. Now, Dr. Soham, we have some questions, some interesting ones. I could take a few questions. Actually, the, uh, the participants were so mesmerized with your presentation, they forgot to look into the chat box. And uh, that's sure, I know. And you'll be happy that uh, we had around 220 participants. Uh, and I'm sure next time when you come back, you will be expecting more than 300 because uh, I know uh, good scholars uh, need no introduction. Their work, their uh, presentation, their research speaks for themselves. And I'm so happy that uh, Gnosis has provided a platform to a scholar like you and it has acted like a bridge to, you know, present you before the world of academia. There are, you know, uh, people who have joined us from Philippines, Pakistan, Belgium, South Africa right now. So we are so happy that Gnosis is able to provide that platform, is trying to act as a bridge between a good scholar and good academicians. Uh, thank you for giving us that honor as well. And uh, yeah, as I said that, uh, although uh, they were so mesmerized, but still we have some very interesting questions. Uh, question number one, uh, we have from uh, Muhammad Ikram. Uh, Mohan, sorry, Muhammad Akram. Muhammad Akram is from Burewala, Pakistan. Uh, his question is, don't you think that we have same biological similarities with Western Oedipus complex, but with varying degree and intensity in the subcontinent? Absolutely, because we are Indo-Aryans. Actually, I'm not talking about it from the ethnic or genetic point of view, but I'm talking about it from the cultural perspective that the Mahabharata, the Vedas, those are Indo-Aryan products and uh, myths are part of the collective unconscious as Jung said. So yes, the Oedipus complex is shared uh, mostly uh, 
between us but then the oedipus complex is also very much present among people who are of non indo aryan origin uh, as i said the jewish people moses and monotheism and in that very book uh, freud also talks uh, a little bit about islam and uh, there is also a group uh, of essays uh, in a collection named the arabic freud where i don't remember the name of the editor there he talks about uh, the applicability of uh, the oedipus complex ideas uh, to uh, islam so yes the oedipus complex can be uh, considered to be uh, uh, present in varying degrees among both europeans and pakistanis and uh, indians the south asians yes and yes also salman akhtar has a book uh, on uh, the oedipus complex in southeast asia and east asia uh, anybody can download it so there are three essays one on uh, the uh, freud in china one on freud in japan and i think one on freud in korea so yes uh, what he said is absolutely true uh there's a question from an assistant professor from sri satya sai college for women i am sorry i missed the name her question is is there any indian parallel to electra complex indian parallel to electra complex yes. well uh, i cannot say it right now i cannot say it right now because uh, indian mythology is Uh, very much uh, androcentric uh, so uh, there is very little about the girl child and even in the krishna myth the girl is exchanged for the boy so wherever there is a child it's almost invariably the male child thank you sir the third question is from uh, uh, gopika kulkarni she is an assistant professor of english her question is leadership is the way of resilience in the pandemic but in oedipus plague follow the bad leadership how can you link the present situation uh, could you please uh, repeat the question uh, leadership leadership is the way of resilience in the pandemic okay Okay. but in oedipus plague follow the bad leadership how can plague? you link the present yeah plague plague then plague uh, follow the bad leadership follow the bad leadership okay how can you link the present situation <laughs> well in the present situation i think uh bad leadership yes we are really having a very bad leadership these days and uh, leadership leads to resilience but i would say that edipus uh, was not really a bad leader in the beginning because he did kill the sphinx and he rescued the country so we cannot say that he was a bad leader um, and uh, then the plague followed was it because of his bad leadership or because of what was already ordained so there is a kind of uh, fatality uh, there fatalism playing there i don't think these concepts can be easily applicable to uh, the present scenario uh, as we are poles apart from edipus's time next question by dr shivani sharma her question is how relevant do you think the psychoanalytic theory stands today as we are entering an age where digital humanities is going to be center stage i myself am a bit of a technophobe uh, i It did uh, pay much attention to uh, Professor Kethkar's lecture the other day to know more about digital humanities. I am not competent to answer this question, but uh, even then, I would try to say that uh, uh, psychoanalysis is developing each day by the help of technology, 
and uh, actually ashish nondi in his essay uh, complains that indian psychoanalysis was restricted uh, in the early phase because of uh, technological backwardness so in the future i think technology will only enhance psychoanalytic studies i think so. uh, the next question is from our very own dr indira nitanandam ma'am her question is would you link uh, it to an innate ability of the father to accept the success of his son while a mother looks forward to the progress of her daughter well dr nitanandan you have uh, really put me in trouble <laughs> i must say yes uh, uh, there is a mother daughter dyad also that is uh, discussed by ak ramanujan sudhir kakar and others yes i have a problem in uh, accepting what you say but then the father is not really uh, uh, always uh, fond of the son and the mother always fond of the daughter i think that uh, neither the heterosexual nor the homosexual binaries work here because uh, i think that uh, especially these days in nuclear families both uh, male and female children receive uh, equal attention and uh, i don't think uh, this is the case the next question is from uh, i uh, tapeshwar prasad tapeshwar prasad is a doctor and works at sanjeevias college patna his question is how can we synchronize the concept of oedipus complex comparing the sense of ardhanarishwar the god shiva and in what way two bodies in one soul or vice versa could do justice with the said freudian theory i think there is a very nice and exhaustive book on this topic and uh, not just one but two books one is uh, wendy doniger's now classic work women androgens and uh, other mythical beasts and another is uh, a book by ellen goldberg it's called ardhanarishwara or the lord who is half woman uh, in uh, both these books they have talked about the relation between androgyny and uh, psychoanalysis i think that uh, despite uh, uh, all our attempts to be gender just uh, ardhanarishwara or uh, androgens are actually always uh, prioritizing the male half and uh, there is a kind of effacement of the feminine half uh, in uh, this kind of construct uh, and uh, you can also uh, think about the uh, the um, the vertical and uh, horizontal androgens the vertical androgens are uh, more uh, complete in uh, every respect because uh, they have two halves uh, one male and one female though as i said the male half is on the right so it's uh, basically the male half that is the primary one but in a uh, horizon in an hori is a horizontal uh, androgen the sexual organ actually gives the identity and often it is problemized uh, so uh, in either case uh, i think psychoanalysis uh, whenever it approaches the question of the androgen uh, is prioritizing uh, the male half though there have been attempts to rescue uh, the symbol of the androgen uh, from uh, this kind of uh, uh, patriarchal bias thank you next question is from sharda devi she is a research scholar 
in the institute of english university of kerala her question is do you think we can study freud and oedipus complex by connecting it with disability actually uh, this has already been done uh, actually two years uh, two three years ago there was a conference in jnu where there were uh, papers read about the connection between psychoanalysis a paper on Parashtra and there was also a paper on Ekalavya, there was a paper on, on Oedipus. So yes, this is uh, nothing new. This is already something that is happening, though I am not into disability studies, but yes, this is something that is happening. Actually, she is a scholar who is working on disability studies and uh, okay. she is a great example of, a, of a, I will not call, consider her to be disabled. But uh, physically not uh, perfect, but she's doing great work as a scholar. Uh, she's a very versatile character. I know her for a long time over Facebook and I follow her. Congratulations, ma'am. Dr. Megha Singh from uh, Sri Satya Sai College for Women Bhopal. Her question is, is there any Indian psychoanalytic view regarding Oedipus complex? Can you suggest any book based on it? That was my presentation. That was what my presentation was about. But yes, uh, you can uh, read uh, this uh, reader, Vishnu on Freud's desk, edited by Vaidyanathan and Kripal. Uh, you will find most of the uh, relevant articles and extracts from uh, good books there. Uh, and uh, apart from that, Sudhir Kakar's The Inner World is a very nice book. Okay, we move on to the next question. Smruti, uh, Dr. Smruti K, her question is, do you think the differences in theory in Indian and Western world could be attributed to the nuclear versus joint family systems? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because uh, this is something which uh, is... Uh, already noticed by A.K. Ramanujan and Sudhir Kakar yeah, in their books and even before that, not just India, but uh, the Algerian thinker Franz Fano writes in The Wretched of the Earth about the individual's uh, choices and uh, limitations uh, as a uh, social being. Uh, yes, uh, Freud uh, uh, is also writing from a specific socio-cultural milieu while uh, here we have a joint family and because of the joint family here in uh, Indian myths and also in the Indian psyche, we have uh, uh, several father figures at a time uh, lurking in our minds, the elder brother, the guru, the uh, chacha ji, the mama ji are all father figures for us. Similarly, we have uh, myths of the same goddess, the same Adi Shakti, uh, taking the form of different uh, goddesses. This is also again a case where uh, we project the many mothers in the same family, the Chachi uh, and the grandmother, the biological mother, the Bhabi and the elder sister, unmarried elder sister as uh, being the same uh, mother uh, figure. So Yes, that is also very much there. Next question is from Dr. Sodata Ray, uh, Associate Professor from Kitanjali College of Engineering, Hyderabad. Question is, can Oedipus complex be taken as one of the reasons for gay and lesbianism as infant's fear of castration takes a shape of real trauma during childhood? In, uh, <laughs> to be very short, yes. Freud says that. Yes, so it is one of the reasons behind the homosexuality. Even Girindra Shekhar says that. But then I'm uh, not into genetics or epigenetics. So modern science, what modern science says can be markedly varied from what Freud said 200 years ago because Freud is actually a sage of yore when it comes to 
clinical psychology. Uh, for us, Freud is a god, but not for those who are studying psychology as of now. So modern science has evolved a lot and there are many more uh, insights coming up every single hour. Uh, but yes, if we go by what is written uh, in the pages of Freud's works and what is written by Greenberg Shikhar, Oedipus Complex is certainly uh, one of the reasons behind homosexuality. Thank you. Next question is, uh, I didn't get the name of the contributor, uh, but the question is very uh, important, I felt, so I'm asking you. It is a sad fact that Indian strains of psychoanalysis have not entered much into the sphere of Indian academics. Do you think anticipation of cultural resistance has led to the disappearance of such theories from syllabuses of Indian universities? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you see what uh, Freud faced immediately after his ideas were published was a strong cultural resistance. And uh, in India, as I said, even Tagore was not welcoming of Freud's ideas uh, initially. Uh, and uh, even today, I think, and from my own experience, I can say that when I was a kid, uh, the first time I knew of Freud was when somebody uh, smiled and took the name of Freud and said uh, that uh, he was a highly pornographic writer. And uh, I was not conversant with uh, the ideas of Freud. I didn't even know his name. I was, I was just in class eight or nine. When I, and two of my friends, uh, I, sh I should say precautious friends, were laughing and taking the name of Freud. I asked who Freud was and they said, Freud is uh, the Watsayan of the West. So there is a kind of misconception among the lay people about Freud and his ideas and they think that they should resist these ideas. And uh, what my uh, friends said that day doesn't uh, hurt me anymore because I realized that they too were kids. But in high school, uh, I was in a Ramakrishna mission and one of the Swamis of the Ramakrishna mission one day said in class that uh, the Upanishads and Vedantic thought are antidotes and mark the use of the word antidote to the ideas of Freud, Darwin and uh, Karl Marx. So these are poisonous elements. So yes, <laughs> cultural resistance is a part. <laughs> Next question is from a PhD scholar from Eflu uh, Shillong, Sangam Bahadur Chetri. His question is, is there a way of resolving Oedipus complex and how it will help our generation to not be a competitor of our child as we know the psychology of the child and what it thinks of the father? I think that question should be answered by a married man who has a family, not by an academic. But yes, uh, I must uh, say that uh, the father uh, should not impose his or her ideas, or not her, his ideas, his dominating attitude on the child. Mm, I think we, uh, we cannot actually stop uh, the ideas of indiv individuality coming from the West. So the child must be given uh, the free space to think for himself. And the more domineering the father, the more uh, the Oedipus complex is uh, problematic in the child. I think uh, the fathers must take uh, lessons from their own lives. And for example, I myself would never force my child uh, to study science. My father forced me. I didn't. I rebelled against him and then I studied literature and I am now who I had always wanted to be, a literature teacher. And uh, I think uh, these are lessons which we should uh, uh, take from our past and we should uh, stop ourselves from intervening in the lives of our children. Uh, Dr. Ro Robert Tig Pinar from Philippine University. His question is, 
can we link feminism in the concept of oedipal mother or oedipal goddesses yes yes actually uh, feminists have uh, always been vehemently critical of freud but there are some uh, feminist elements in freud's own writings which we shouldn't ignore if freud has ever been uh, a misogynist then he has not been a misogynist consciously uh, i don't remember right now but i did read quite a few essays uh, way back in 2010 uh which were claiming freud as uh, freud's idea of oedipus and the oedipal mother as one of the early expositions of a uh, dominating uh, female uh and uh i think that uh, oedipal mother and uh, or the phallic goddess is certainly a source of uh, feminist uh, expression in american poetry uh the goddess centered american poetry uh, and uh, i think there is also an anthology of poem uh, poems named she rises like the sun uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, something that is already uh, been much discussed in the academia however at the same time i must say that just because there is an edipal mother or there is a phallic goddess doesn't mean that uh, the idea of a of a strong goddess character would actually be liberating for uh, true uh, flesh and blood women in the society this is something which has uh, left american goddess feminists uh, troubled because they have always thought that worshiping a strong goddess character instead of a masculine god uh, is liberating for women but whenever they have turned to india for their inspiration they have found that india has a very living goddess tradition but uh, india doesn't have gender equality when it comes to uh, actual uh, social structure thank you sir uh, thank you soham for you know presenting your answers answering these questions so beautifully uh one question from an assistant professor of Kamrup College, Guwahati University. Her question is: Her name is Elizabeth L. Thick, and her question is: What about sibling li- uh, rivalry for attention from parents? Yes, sibling rivalry is something which I didn't touch upon here. Uh, sibling rivalry, I think, uh, uh, right now I cannot answer it because. um no right right now i i cannot uh, relate it to edipus complex but maybe on a different occasion just for the participants uh, i would like to on behalf of nosis i would like to inform you all that uh, in the due course of our nosis issues uh, what we will do is we are recording these questions and we will send it to our uh, resource persons and we will request them to answer these questions type it and uh, mail it back to us so what we will do is we will release four or five uh, interviews or these question answers in every issue of nosis from uh, july onwards and that will be available online also so some of the questions will be beautifully put uh, when you can visit the online section of course that will take time because everything of the current uh, scenario crisis i told you but yes we are planning to release four or five uh, question answer rounds of our experts in every issue so for the next one year you will have these uh, question answers beautifully put forward by the experts so you can go for the nosis website 3 uh, 4 months from now and you will find them next question is from uh, dr malarthi from uh, tamil nadu her question is can you suggest any book which has all the key terms of freudian theories that may be used in analyzing a literary text for a student of literature yes a comprehensive dictionary of psychoanalysis by salman akhtar thank you uh, soham anubhav garai is a student from calcutta university his question is i request you to elaborate the concept of oedipal mother and the femininity of father and how the son takes over his place in this case according to girindra shekhar 
the 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 sun does not unilaterally have a rivalry towards the father the son also imitates its mother's actions so the son is actually not just uh, the son doesn't know its mother only as its object of desire so it doesn't only extract pleasure from the touch from the caress but it also imitates her actions and as it keeps imitating her actions it realizes that she is also attending to another person and by imitation he tries to become like her and this is not the identification of ego but the identification of actions so and a grindra shikhar uh, actually refers to uh, the play of uh, children where they just uh, avail themselves and imitate being the wife and uh, they uh, sometimes uh, boys put on the ornaments of their mothers they don themselves in their mother's sarees and this is a play which is played by both uh, uh, boys and girls so he says that this is uh, the femininity of the mother that they want to adopt and they want to become the father's wife and wants uh, want to uh, bear children by the father gradually what happens is that this femininity father also gives rise to an uh, wish and that opposite wish is that to dominate the father like he dominates his wife so the child is not just open to the mother's actions but also to the father's actions the child at this point starts imitating the father and wants to become like the father or i mean the husband towards the wife so in the first phase of the fantasy he wants to be the wife and he wants his father to be the husband in the second phase which is uh, actually an outcome of the first phase he wants to be the husband and he wants his father to be the wife so this is a very complicated stage where on one hand he wants himself to be castrated because he doesn't want to have the male identity on the other hand he wants to have the male identity and wants his father to lose the female the male identity so in this tension of two rival wishes he gradually finds a solution a resolution where he transfers the feminine aspect of the father the fe the, the feminine fantasy which he associates with the father to the mother and there there starts the oedipus complex not at an early stage so there he uh, finally uh, transforms the father his uh, love hate relationship for the father to the mother and in his imagination now there is a combined image of the feminine father the meaning father and also the mother as the love object so that is a combined uh, uh, imago the oedipal mother which is a source of both dread affection and also uh, a source of love and attention yeah now the next question is from uh, dr lopa mudra her question is we have warrior princes for example Chin Chitrangada, groomed as a prince, until defeated by Arjuna, her identity was not revealed. In which category of Indian Oedipus complex uh, you referred would this myth fit in? Uh, who is the uh, person to ask the question? The person is Dr. Lopa Mudra. Dr. Lopa Mudra, I must say that this is not the. Uh, uh, version of the beat that is in the mahabharata this is tagore's own version in mahabharata actually chitrangada was as feminine a princess as anybody else and she was a coveted daughter of uh, the king of manipur and uh, arjuna fell in love with her and she was 
happily married off by her father to Arjuna. So this is something which for, uh, which Tagore himself uh, thinks of. I do not think that uh, uh, the this warlike Chitrangada fits in the original uh, Freudian structure. Uh, but yes, there are other examples in the Mahabharata. For example, uh, Shikhandini uh, was a princess who was brought up by King Drupada as uh, a prince and she was married to the daughter of the king of Dasharna and when the king of Dasharna uh, realized that uh, whom she thought to be uh, her daughter's uh, husband was uh, was actually a woman he threatened uh, to destroy the kingdom of Panchala so uh, Shikhandini went to the forest and exchanged his gender with a yaksha and came back as a male so in this context i would say that uh, the story of shikhandini uh, is very clear about the fact that she is born as a woman and she was amba a woman in her earlier life and wendy doniger says that this myth is uh, uh, an evidence of the fact that the indians think that gender is something which sticks to the atman and it sticks to memory so she carries her gender over to her next life so she is a hundred percent woman when she is born she is brought up as a man and she ends up being a man so in this context i think that uh, when she is brought up she she we don't know about anything about her attachment to her mother but she was certainly not uh, born of the sacrificial fire as draupadi was born she did have an earthly mother but we don't know about her and uh, she is neither uh, she is attached certainly attached to her father otherwise she wouldn't have sacrificed uh, her life so i think in this case she is actually having an electra complex or uh, she is having uh, she she is she is fond of her father you know, so it is a kind of straightforward uh, oedipus complex a heterosexual uh, constellation and later on when he is a boy by then he is already grown up and he already has uh, his uh, oedipus complex resolved thank you dr soham the last question uh, the name I could not, uh, I think the name was not mentioned. So, but this is a pertinent question. And this is the last question. Could we make any relation between Oedipus complex and adolescent psychological trauma? That is the topic of a book that cannot be answered in a single sentence. But yes, of course we can. Well, that is it for now. Uh, that uh, uh, brings to an end of a very, really fascinating and interesting uh, session by Dr. Soham. I'm sure a lot of observations and questions. Dr. Soham has answered 21 questions, by the way, and the, la the largest number so far till date. And he very, very patiently, he has answered, as you can see. And Dr. Soham, you would be happy to know that after your session also and after now all the 21 questions we still have 139 participants with us God. that that clearly so honored. testifies the kind of presentation and the way you have answered the questions thank you so much uh, dr so uh, on behalf of team gnosis it's a honor to have you and uh, for your for your very beautifully meticulous and uh, uh, a topic uh, which needs a lot of attention in the field of academia. So on behalf of Team Gnosis, Dr. Soham, thank you so much. Hope to see you very soon. Take very good care of yourself. And uh, before we end, dear participants, just an information including Dr. Soham. Tomorrow we have a scholar from University of South Africa. He will be talking on uh, decolonization and he will be talking on a lot of white supremacy how is how has how has decolonization an important role to play very interesting uh, topic his uh, name is lesa molloy 
Lesa Mulloy will be presenting the, uh, the presentation tomorrow at 5.30. If you have time, please do join in for the presentation. Thank you very much, dear participants, for sparing your valuable time. And thank you, Dr. Soham, once again on Team Nozis. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure and honor, sheer pleasure and honor to, to host you today. See you tomorrow at 5.30. Please do join us for uh, the session from a scholar from University of South Africa. Thank you so much. Take very good care of yourself. Dr. Soham, you would like to say anything? Uh, I am humbled and I am honored. That's all I can say. And uh, I am happy that so many people uh, are still uh, tuned to the video. Uh, it was beyond expectation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Srikant Banerjee for uh, giving me such a platform. Thank you so much. Without doubt, Dr. Shoham, I can, I can tell you, I can declare without doubt that uh, today's presentation has increased your fan following numbers. That's for sure. Thank so, you, sir. So it was a pleasure. Thank you very much on behalf of Team Gnosis. Thank you so much. Please do take care of yourself. All of you do join us tomorrow for the lecture at 5.30. Take care. Good night for you all. Thank you.